Welcome, brothers and sisters, to this worship service. Special welcome to regular visitors and to guests in our midst, and of course also a warm welcome to those who are connected to our service via live stream. I am Reverend William Den Hollander, often added senior, and I'm the, inter the Minister Emeritus of the Bethel Canadian Reformed Church of Toronto. The consistory has the following announcements. Classes hopes to convene the Lord willing on March the 6th in Coldale. The congregation is asked to submit any matters for classes by January 30th, 2018. Celebrating the Lord's Supper with us this morning is Sister Rebecca Froma from the Canadian Reformed Church at Neilandia South and Sister Ashley Van Lahr of the Canadian Reformed Church in Chilliwack, British Columbia. <clears throat> These are the announcements. Let us now all rise for worship. Congregation, from where does your help and strength come? Receive now the greetings of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us worship our God and sing together from Psalm 108, stanza 1. Psalm 108, my heart is steadfast, O my God. Your mercy I will ever laud. Your name I will in song extol, make melody with all my soul. Psalm 108, stanza 1 is our opening song of praise. Let us now together listen to the law of our God as we find it in Exodus 20. The ten words of the covenant which he has established with us. Let us use it for the scrutiny of our lives. Also as we have been preparing ourselves this past week, looking in the mirror of, your law, of the law in order to know our sins and accursedness but then we will also use it as a guide for our life in thankfulness for his deliverance, which we will celebrate in the Lord's Supper, the deliverance from slavery to sin and Satan. So God speaks all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the house of slavery. <clears throat> You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Then in response, we are going to sing from Psalm 86, seeking also the forgiveness of our sins. You forgive us our transgressions in your mercy and compassion. Psalm 86, the stanzas 2 and 4, using the law in stanza 4 to know the way in which we show our gratitude to the Lord. Psalm 86, 2 and 4, in response to these 10 words. Let us now unite our hearts and minds in prayer to God and seek him in his throne of grace. O 
almighty and eternal God. We enter upon your holy presence in prayer, and we thank you that the way to your throne of grace is open. Yes, we thank you that it is a throne of grace. Already you greeted us with words of grace and of peace. And also, thanks to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, entering upon your holy presence is a gift of grace. And we can do so in peace when we do it on the basis of the work of atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we are together. In his name we approach you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune gods, the Lord, Yahweh, our covenant God. And we thank you that we may be together here in this covenant assembly, in this gathering of believers, that we may be together in order to worship you, because you have manifested yourself in all your greatness, your glory, your power, and your works of creation, which you also uphold as with your own hands, in which you direct the weather. You have also revealed yourself in your words even more clearly. Yes, you have given your word in order that we would have the glasses of scriptures in order to look around in this world and to recognize you, your work, and your power, also in your plan that is unfolding in the midst of this world the work of salvation that is progressing from week to week and from day to day. And Father, in that progress, you also involve us, you engage us, in order that we would continue to serve you and you help us in that service. You bless us for that service. You also guide us in that service by your word and spirit. And so it is such a privilege to be together from week to week in worship before your throne of grace. We may receive the means of grace as well in this service. The proclamation of your words, the administration of the Lord's Supper, and both speak to us of your work, of your love in Jesus Christ, your work of salvation through him. And we thank you, Father, for his work also of reconciliation. It is good again between you and us. And we will be reminded of that by the signs and seals of the Lord's Supper, the bread and wine, in order that we may taste it, that we may touch it, that we may feel it, how good it is to be one with you, to be united with you, to live in communion with you. Not just at the time of our celebration, but throughout this new week as well. We may share in all the benefits and merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is by faith that we do so. And that faith needs to be strengthened all the time. We need to be reminded every day again, as we read your word and have our devotions personally and in our families, when we have our devotions in order to seek you with all our needs, with all our requests, with our joy and thanksgiving for the blessings you bestow on us, then we are reminded time and time again how much we receive by grace from you. And Father, we pray that our service now too may be an expression of awe, of respect, living as we do in the fear of your name, Give that our worship may be a worship of adoration because you are indeed an awesome God and we are so privileged as to belong to you, to your divine family, children. Father, who are we that we may be so privileged? And we pray that it may be impressed once again on our hearts and minds that we need you for our salvation. We need you for our daily provisions. We need you in your guidance, especially if your way with our lives are going to, through difficult times, when there is sorrow, when there is grief. 
When we are living with an empty place, as widow or widower, Father, we pray that you will comfort us and guide us. Also, as we lead our families in service to you, make us faithful to keep our vows. Equip us to do our tasks every day again to your honor and glory. And help us so to begin this new week in Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this is the day that he has made that we would rejoice in it and be glad in it. It is the day of his resurrection, the Lord's day. We pray that you will bless us as we are strengthened in our faith to live in newness of life. Help us also, repenting from our sins, help us to live to the honor and glory of your holy name. This we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. This morning, brothers and sisters, we open the Word of God in the New Testament in Paul's first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we read together the verses 12 through 17. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12 to 17. In response, we will be singing from Hymn 51, the stanzas 1, 2, and 3. But first, let us listen to the Word of God as it speaks to us in 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing hymn 51, the stanzas 1, 2, and 3. This morning, brothers and sisters, I may focus your attention particularly on the verses 15 through 17 
in the passage that we read together. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 to 17 is our text. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's our text. In response to the sermon, we will be singing from hymn 52 to stanzas 1 and 2. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word is reliable. That, brothers and sisters, is literally how the Apostle Paul begins the words of our text. The word is reliable. In most translations, these words are taken as some kind of an introductory clause, followed by an important expression. They are more than that, however. Paul uses these words five times in his epistles to Timothy. Every time he wants to bind its truth on the heart of Timothy, the preacher, also on the hearts of the congregations, the word is reliable. That's an exclamation of faith, of amazement. The word is reliable and therefore deserves to be accepted fully. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Stress that message, Timothy, for that's what the scriptures are all about. So that's the message I may hold up to you this morning. As I summarize our text as follows, Jesus Christ shows mercy to believers like Paul. We see, first of all, that Paul knows this for himself, and secondly, Paul proclaims it to others. So first of all, Paul knows this for himself. Why would Paul emphasize this fact so much, brothers and sisters? Well, because the Lord Jesus personally fulfilled this word in Paul's life. God has shown mercy to me, of all people, Paul adds. Oh sure, Paul knew the God of Israel from the Old Testament scrolls. However, God showed him how all these books are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Paul could recite the words of Psalm 103, he does not treat us as our sin sins deserve or repay us as according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. Now, through Jesus Christ, Paul has come to see the truth of that word. It's true the way it says there. Jesus Christ has come to me in order to save me from a sinful life. Paul also learned why the Lord Jesus did so. Jesus Christ wants to show his unlimited patience in sinners. I am one of them, Paul says. In fact, he writes, I am the first, the foremost among the sinners or the worst, as the NIV translates this expression. Evidently, brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul does not try to hide his sins. He mentions in details the facts from his sinful past. I was once a blasphemer, he says, and a persecutor, 
and a violent man. Verse 13. And indeed we know that life from Acts 8, for instance, where we read how he began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Paul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples in Jerusalem. We read in Acts 9. He did so because he was convinced that Jesus was a deceiver, not the Messiah. Then the Lord Jesus stopped him in his track, literally. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus said from heaven. So Jesus was alive. He wasn't dead. Paul experienced this voice of the Lord Jesus at his conversion as the greatest miracle of his life. He knew. Jesus Christ did not leave me on the way of perdition. He showed mercy to me. He came to save me. He forgave me my sins, of me, the worst of all sinners. He wanted to show his unlimited patience, his long suffering to me. The Lord Jesus used me as an example, he says, to show his unlimited patience. Now the word he uses, unlimited patience or long suffering, is a very special word. It's the opposite of quick tempered or hot tempered. A person who is long suffering, long tempered, knows how to control himself. Literally, the Greek word makrotumia means he has a great bosom, a big heart. He can wait patiently for someone else. Now Paul says about the Lord that he has been long-suffering with him. Extremely patient. It takes a long, long time before he explodes in anger. He gives time for repentance. He keeps seeking the salvation of people. That's how the Lord Jesus dealt with people. He did not condemn people for their sins, but told them to repent. Oh sure, he warned them for the judgment that's coming. Yet he gave time for repentance. He showed his long suffering, for instance, to the woman who had committed adultery. And the Pharisees had said, Sir, Moses commanded that such a one should be stoned. Jesus said, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. True, they could have stoned her according to the letter of the law. However, the Lord Jesus showed God's long suffering. He doesn't condemn on the spot. Jesus was sent into the world to save sinners. He told the woman, go. I won't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. God is long-suffering. He delays His wrath. He wants the repentance of sinners, not their death. That's how the Lord Jesus showed His unlimited patience. He was going to die for this woman. And He gave her time to repent. That's how the Lord Jesus dealt with Paul too, beloved. That's the mercy and long-suffering he shows us as well. He shows unlimited patience. The word Paul uses denotes a patience shown to him all his life long. Paul knew himself too well to realize how much he needed it. The things I want to do, I don't, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Yet Paul knew of the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. The Lord had placed him on the way of life in Jesus Christ. 
He did so in order to show his unlimited patience to him, to help him in his struggle with sin. Paul keeps up this battle with sin in order that he may take hold of the prize for which God called him in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind, he strains towards what is ahead. That he doesn't forget the sins from which the Lord saved him. No, he forgets that life of self-righteousness. He forgets the ways of self-deliverance. He looks forward to the goal of his life in Jesus Christ, which he will reach only through the mercy of God and his unlimited patience. So Paul also, in the second place, proclaims this to others. Now the Apostle Paul, brothers and sisters, describes this as an example. He doesn't dwell on it as an interesting conversion story, or to draw the attention to himself. No, he wants all God's children to believe in the Lord Jesus and to receive salvation in him. As you know, sometimes we hang on to our sins for a long time. It's hard to break with it. Oh, we may think of ourselves as still pretty good, generally speaking, until we come to realize how there may be a certain sin, a certain transgression, or a certain weakness which we condone or cherish even. It could also be that you look back over your life and that you see the kind of sinful practices that were rampant in the past until the Lord said, that's it. Stop it. That's the moment the Lord wants to show you His mercy. Then you realize how the Lord could have punished you. Yet He didn't. He has been long-suffering with you. He wanted to show His unlimited patience to you too. He does not treat us according to our sins nor requite us according to our iniquities, but He forgives our sins. He restores us to Himself. He gives us His Holy Spirit to fight against sin and to overcome those iniquities in our life, just like He did with Paul, and took Him into His service, giving Him strength. That's when you exclaim in faith, The Word is reliable. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Beloved, do you believe the mercy of God in Jesus Christ? Of course, then you don't take His long-suffering for granted. You don't speculate on it either, continuing in sin in the assumption that there may be a day later on at which you may repent. No, today, when you hear his voice, repent. Repent. Take out that root of bitterness which is leading you to sin, to to a sinful attitude. Repent every day anew, for the day of reckoning is coming. God's long-suffering is not so unlimited that he won't come with his judgments. Those who don't repent and who don't believe will experience his wrath. Today, however, is the day of his mercy. Today is the day of his unlimited patience. And what patience he has us indeed. Well, that's okay, for he wants it. And he wants you to use the time of his favor, the time of his patience, for you to fight against sin and for you to strain toward the goal of perfection. 
No one here should pretend that he or she is better than the rest, beloved. You don't have to display all your sins from your former life either. However, you don't have to ignore or cover up your sins. For they may be confessed as those for which Christ has obtained forgiveness. They are the sins which keep you humble about yourself. So that you don't look down on others. Rather, you live by grace, receiving this forgiveness and using that same grace and mercy of God to forgive others. I am the worst of all sinners, says Paul. The Lord needs to be patient with me especially. And he must show me mercy every day. Well, he does. He saves me. Yes, me too. He has come to save you. Yes, you too. That's what God's Word is all about. That's what the church is all about, Paul says to Timothy. That's what we celebrate in the church when we receive the sign and seal of the Lord's Supper. Then we may touch and taste the mercy and patience of the Lord in Jesus Christ. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we proceed to the administration of the Lord's Supper, let us first together turn to page 603 in the back of our book of praise and read the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Page 603. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, The Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of this institution as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. In order that we may now celebrate this holy supper of the Lord to our comfort, we must first rightly examine ourselves. Further, we must use it as Christ intended it, namely, to his remembrance. True self-examination consists of the following three parts. First, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. For the wrath of God against sin is so great that he could not leave it unpunished but has punished it in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Second, let everyone search his heart whether he also believes the sure promise of God that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is freely given him as his own as if he himself had fulfilled all righteousness. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life, and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. God will certainly receive in grace all who are thus minded and count them worthy to partake of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not feel this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Therefore, according to the command of Christ and of the Apostle Paul, we admonish all those who know themselves to be guilty of the following offensive sins, to abstain from the table of the Lord. And we declare to them that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ. All who refuse to trust in the Lord alone, or who serve him in their own manner, all who abuse the name of the Lord by cursing or in any other way, all who do not diligently attend to worship services, and who despise the proclamation of God's word or the sanctity of the sacraments, all who are disobedient to their parents or to others in authority over them, all who violate human life or cherish hatred against their neighbor and refuse to be reconciled to him, all who either within or outside of holy wedlock do not keep their bodies pure, All who by stealing, greed, and extravagance lead a worldly life. All liars, backbiters, and slanderers. Briefly, all who either in word or conduct show themselves to be unbelieving by leading an offensive life. While they persist in their sins, they shall not take of this food which Christ has ordained only for his believers. Otherwise, their judgment and condemnation will be the heavier. But all this, beloved brothers and sisters, is not meant to discourage broken and contrite hearts, as if only those who are without sin may come to the table of the Lord. For we do not come to this supper to declare that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves, 
On the contrary, we seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we acknowledge that we are dead in ourselves. We also are aware of our many sins and shortcomings. We do not have perfect faith, and we do not serve God with such zeal as he requires. Daily we have to contend with the weakness of our faith and with the evil desires of our flesh. Yet, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we are heartily sorry for these shortcomings and desire to fight against our unbelief and to live according to all the commandments of God. Therefore, we may be fully assured that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can prevent us from being received by God in grace and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly food and drink. Let us now consider for what purpose the Lord has instituted his supper. Namely, that we should use it in remembrance of him. We are to remember him in the following manner. First of all, let us fully trust that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into this world according to the promises made from the beginning to the fathers in the Old Testament and that he assumed our flesh and blood. From the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life on earth, he bore for us the wrath of God, under which we should have perished eternally. By his perfect obedience, he has for us fulfilled all the righteousness of God's law. We remember in particular that the weight of the wrath of God caused by our sins pressed out of him, sweat like drops of blood, falling on the ground in the garden of Gethsemane. There he was bound that he might free us from our sins. He suffered countless insults that we might never be put to shame. Though innocent, he was condemned to death that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God. He even let his blessed body be nailed to the cross that he might cancel the bond which stood against us because of our sins. By all this, he has taken our curse upon himself that he might fill us with his blessing. On the cross, he humbled himself in body and soul to the very deepest shame and anguish of hell then he called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we might be accepted by God and nevermore be forsaken by him. Finally, by his death and the shedding of his blood, he confirmed the new and eternal testament, the covenant of grace, when he said, It is finished in order that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, during his last Passover, instituted the Holy Supper. He gave the bread and the cup to his disciples in remembrance of him. He taught us to understand that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are reminded and assured of his hearty love and faithfulness toward us. It is a sure pledge that he has given his body and shed his blood for us. Otherwise, we would have suffered eternal death. He nourishes and refreshes our hungry and thirsty souls with his crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life as certainly as this bread is broken before our eyes and this cup is given to us and we eat and drink in remembrance of him. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we learn that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice, 
once offered on the cross. It is the only ground for our salvation. Thereby he has become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true food and drink of life eternal. For by his death he has removed the cause of our eternal hunger and misery, which is sin, and obtained for us the life-giving Spirit. By this Spirit, who dwells in Christ as the head and in us as his members, we have true communion with him and share in all his riches, life eternal, righteousness and glory. By the same Spirit we are also united in true brotherly love as members of one body. For the Apostle Paul says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. As one bread is baked out of many grains and one wine is pressed out of many grapes, so we all, incorporated in Christ by faith, are together one body. For the sake of Christ, who so exceedingly loved us first, we shall now love one another and shall show this to one another, not just in words, but also in deeds. Finally, Christ has commanded us to celebrate the Holy Supper until he comes. We receive at his table a foretaste of the abundant joy which he has promised and look forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb when he will drink the wine new with us in the kingdom of his Father. Let us rejoice and give him the glory for the marriage feast of the Lamb is coming. May the Almighty Heavenly God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, help us in this through his Holy Spirit. Amen. To receive all this, let us humble ourselves before God in prayer and call upon him in true faith. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in this supper we cherish the blessed memory of the bitter death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit so that we may entrust ourselves more and more to your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that our contrite hearts may be nourished with his true body and blood, yet with him who is the only heavenly bread, that we may not live in our sins, but Christ in us and we in him. Let us so truly be partakers of the new and everlasting testament, the covenant of grace, that we do not doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father, nevermore imputing to us our sins, but providing us with all things for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may take up our cross joyfully, deny ourselves, and confess our Savior. Let us in all tribulation await our Lord Jesus Christ, who will come from heaven to change our mortal body to be like his glorious body and take us to himself forever. Hear us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now all rise and profess our Catholic, undoubted Christian faith by singing together our apostolic confession in hymn one.
brothers and sisters, in order that we may now be nourished with Christ, the true heavenly bread, we must not cling with our hearts to the outward symbols of bread and wine, but lift our hearts on high in heaven, where Christ our advocate is at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him. We now invite all communicant members and guests in good standing admitted with an attestation to participate. Also the congregation is notified that on the bread, on the bread tray, there are individually wrapped pieces of gluten-free bread which is designated for those who have requested it. And at the center of the wine tray there is grape juice which is for those who have requested it. As the table is being prepared, let us sing together from hymn 59, the stanzas 1 and 2.
The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take it, eat, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take it, drink from it, all of you. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
the Lamb of God we bless. You, through your cross, redemption sent us. And to the Father you present us as priests and kings in holiness. O Savior, you have ransomed us. Let us join voices and express our gratitude for this celebration and at this celebration with the singing of hymn 26. In the Lord. Since the Lord has now nourished our souls at his table, let us together praise his holy name. Let everyone say in his heart, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pits, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood,
For shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Therefore my heart and my mouth shall proclaim the praise of the Lord from now on and forevermore. Amen. Let us give thanks. Father, we thank you that in your boundless mercy you have given us your only begotten Son as our mediator. We praise you that he is the sacrifice for our sins and our food and drink to life eternal. We thank you that you give us a true faith through which we may share in such great benefits. Through your Son, you have instituted the Holy Supper for the strengthening of our faith. We earnestly ask you, faithful God and Father, that by your Holy Spirit this celebration may lead to our daily increase in true faith and fellowship with Christ, your beloved Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us now also show our thankfulness by our offerings by which, we celebrate, by which we support our needy brothers and sisters in the ministry of mercy. After your offerings have been collected, we will sing in conclusion from Psalm 103, the stanzas 4, 6, and 7.
Lift thou your hearts to the Lord. Receive his blessing and depart in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen.